How strong is Pandora's actor? Part 2. Last time we went really in depth into what exactly a doppelganger was, but this time we're going to focus on everything else that goes into making Pandora's actor such a versatile asset to Nazarick. As usual though, before we start, here's the obligatory merch plug, link in the description. Now, let's begin. As we focus more on Pandora's actor specifically, we should look at his level breakdown once again. As previously mentioned, it was 15 levels in Doppelganger, 10 levels in Greater Doppelganger, and 20 more Unknown, assumed to be more Doppelganger variants or subtypes. This gives him a total of 45 different transformations, and if our theory from the last video is correct, that means that Pandora's actor has 46 forms in total, each of the 41 members of Ayn's Uogon, his ordinary doppelganger form, and then 4 more mystery forms. What are they, you might ask? Well, nobody knows. They could be literally anything, or even nothing. Perhaps Ayn's just never picked anything and left them open as wildcard slots. As for his known transformations, well, there's a large list of Ayn's Ulgon members whose races, builds, and roles in the guild were relatively well known and well defined. And I don't think it would be a proper explained video if I didn't briefly cover each of them. Just keep in mind though, as I summarize their build and skills with a bunch of one-liners, Pandora's actor can fully replicate them when imitating their form, making whatever they specialized in his own specialty. So in his selection of transformations, he first has Momonga, the skeletal necromancer and death magic specialist, whose dark wisdom skill has allowed him to learn 700 different spells, making him the most flexible and versatile mage in the guild. Touch Me, the insectoid paladin, the strongest 1v1 fighter of the guild and the one who held the title and class of world champion, marking him amongst the strongest in the entire game. Nishikiyun Rai, the half golem ninja who specialized in one shot kill assassinations delivered from stealth, and he was adept at stealth operations and reconnaissance. Warrior Take Mikazuchi, the Nephilim samurai who specialized in attacks with large charge up times that inflicted massive damage. He also loved creating and customizing katanas. Amano Mahitotsu, the Crustacean Blacksmith. He led the guild's crafters and adventured around collecting rare materials. Pero Ronchino, the Birdman Sniper that specialized in ultra-long-ranged combat and could snipe people across open ground from 2 kilometers out. If you're wondering, this would be the type of character that I'd like to play as. Bukubuku Chagama, the Slime Commander, who led raids and expeditions as well as was an expert in aggro management as the indomitable frontline tank. She was also one of the only three female members of the guild. Hirohiro, the Elder Black Ooze Monk that specialized in dissolving the enemy's equipment to render it useless. Tabula Smeragdina, the Brain Eater Alchemist, an adept spellcaster who also dabbled in the creation of alchemical items and potions. Punito Moe, the Death Vine Strategist. He led and instructed the guild members in its PvP and guild versus guild endeavors, as well as was an expert in military strategy. Ulbert Elaine Odo, the Demon Arch Sage known for extremely flashy and powerful damage spells which could outstrip even super tier spells, but also at the cost of draining most of his mana instantly. Yamaiko, the Nephilim spiritualist, who had the most powerful healing spells of the entire guild and could fill the role of an off tank in emergencies, she was another of the three female members of the guild. Now as we go through more of the guild members, we get to the ones whose class, race, or build details were only briefly mentioned but never thoroughly explained. So out of these we have Blue Planet, a druid which probably entailed either nature related spells or summons incorporating magical plants and creatures. Bell River, a magic knight who fought with a mix of swordplay, spells, and buffs. He was a jack of all trades master of none type character. Variable Talisman, a frontline tank that was around as good in that role as Bukubuku Chagama. Tigris Euphrates, who was a ranger or thief of some kind, so he was skilled at reconnaissance and enjoyed adventuring. Flatfoot, an assassin who was also personally skilled in reconnaissance and anti-stealth operations, despite his build not being focused around it. Nyarita, a merchant and appraisal related specialist. And finally, Nubo, a divination specialist that could detect magical surveillance and infiltrators, allowing him to spy on others and protect the guild from being spied on. The other 22 members are either only known by name or just completely unknown. The 12 that do have names are Ankoro Mochimochi, Beast King Mekongoa, White Brim, Ancient One, Wish 3, Tsudata, Temperance, Garnet, Shijuten Suzaku, Lucifer, Genjiro, and Kuderas, which leaves a further 10 members whose names and identities have yet to be mentioned. Now knowing this information, 
It's a good time to highlight the connection these transformations have to his role as the area guardian of the treasury, the place where all the guild members' equipment was enshrined, marking the treasury as a domain that is highly tailored and synergistic to Pandora's actor's abilities. Being able to transform into any of the guild members, as well as being located in the room where all their equipment and weapons are stored, pretty much marks the treasury as Pandora's actor's personal inventory. He could make use of any of the guild equipment lying around on the various statues. As I said last video, though he can transform into the guild members and mimic their capabilities, he can't mimic the physical equipment. He can only bypass the racial and class restrictions, meaning that he needs to equip the gear himself in order to use it. So in the event of an invasion, he'd have easy access to all the guild's most valuable and powerful items. Though if invaders did somehow manage to reach the treasury, the statues that stand there were already designed to come to life and attack any intruders that attempted to breach this area, specifically anyone wearing the Ring of Ein's Urgon who could just teleport in and attempt to loot it. It was assumed during their design that only intruders would not know the ring needed to be removed before entering the treasury, but in the off chance an enemy did teleport into it and was able to destroy the statues bearing the equipment of guild members past, perhaps in that case Pandora's actor could swoop in, transform into that respective guild member, and engage the invaders in combat with those same items. It's not like he wouldn't be proficient with these items either. Remember, Pandora's actor knows everything about every item in the treasury, including their capabilities and how best to use them. So basically, the home field advantage he gets from being in the treasury means you really don't want to fight him there. But the odds of that ever happening in the new world are very, very slim. So as of late, Ainz has been giving Pandora's actor jobs that are actually related to his transformation ability, and not just keeping him locked up all day in the treasury counting coins or polishing armor. Specifically, Pandora's actor has seen frequent use, both in the anime and the light novel, as Ainz's body double. In the final episode of Season 3, it was Pandora's actor who was disguised as Momo. You could tell by his signature dramatic flair and the dialogue that he has with Albedo, but there were other situations as well. You may not have realized this, but when Ainz was interrogating Sivas about his suspicious behavior back in Season 2, this was also Pandora's actor in disguise. The clues are all there if you rewatch it with this in mind. The most obvious is when he recognizes Suare as being Nina's sister. It's only after he teleports away and then returns that he notices that Suare bears a striking resemblance to the girl that he adventured with in the Swords of Darkness back in Season 1. This is because Pandora's actor only swaps out with Ainz after they verified that Sibas is loyal to Nazareth. After all, as a level 100 NPC, Sibas might have been able to assassinate or at least grievously wound Ainz at the cost of his own life out of desperation. There's also a striking contrast between Ainz's mannerisms before and after he teleports. He uses very derogatory language to talk about Suare when we first see him, but when he returns, he's back to his normal, more composed self. Incidentally, fans have noticed that there's an important visual clue that you can use to determine whether or not Pandora's actor is copying Ainz. Apparently, the red dots in Ainz's eyes disappear. Doppelganger transformations should be perfect, at least in appearance. So perhaps this was an artistic decision to give the impression that Ainz was not acting himself. But all this transformation talk is still related to the usage of his racial class levels. If we shift focus over to his 55 extra job class levels, we see that 35 of them are known. He has 10 levels in Expert, 10 levels in Craftsman, and 15 in Lord of a Castle, with the remaining 20 unknown. From this, it should become more obvious what Ainz was going for with such a build. If you recall, when a doppelganger is in their original form, their doppelganger levels are basically useless. They don't have very good stats and they have no special abilities except for the transformation itself. And when a doppelganger transforms, their entire build changes. This means Pandora's actor loses access to his levels in Craftsman, Expert, and Lord of a Castle whenever he switches forms. So basically, there's no point in trying to make a specialized build with the remaining 55 levels you're not going to be able to create a proper dedicated crafter or thief or whatever when you only have 55 levels to work with. If you want something like that, you're going to want to transform into it. And it's not like you can even use these 55 spare levels to supplement or improve whatever you're transforming into. You will only get to use them when you're in your weak doppelganger form. In fact, there's probably not even a point in leveling anymore at all. 
Knowing that those 55 levels are useless is partly why I think that the maximum level of your transformations depend on your overall character level. Heinz is pretty thrifty, and I don't see him throwing away some of Nazarick's limited custom NPC levels just for fun. It could very well be necessary to level up to 100 in order to mimic level 100 characters. So if you have to level something, you might as well spread things out, dip into a bunch of different things, and go for a non-combat, pure utility build that would be useful when Pandora's actor isn't transformed. This was probably what Eins had intended when choosing these job classes. Craftsman being the first should be self-evident. It lets him create and repair equipment. That said, enchanting equipment with magic abilities requires an enchanter-style class, so it's not like he was going around crafting divine class gear. He would need a much heavier investment in multiple spellcasting and crafting oriented classes to make competitive high level equipment. Most likely, Eins intended for him to use those levels to maintain the weapons and armor in the treasury. He could also have it for lore reasons. After all, he's supposed to be obsessed with handling magical equipment. But there could be practical reasons too. Perhaps equipment degraded over time, even if it wasn't being used and so regular maintenance was necessary, even if you did leave it lying around all day in the treasury. Then we have the Expert class, which is actually one from Dungeons & Dragons. It allows the user to invest heavily in any skills of their choosing, but provides no major combat benefits aside from a very minimal stat increase. An Expert in Dungeons & Dragons can be an Expert in basically anything the user wants them to be. They can be used to improve existing skills, add new ones to their repertoire that they didn't have before, or any mix of the two. Assuming that the author was borrowing from Dungeons and Dragons as he's done in the past, this is probably the purpose of an expert in Yggdrasil as well. Now, Lord of a Castle is the last and least obvious of the three. It seems to be one of the basic classes since it maxes out at level 15, meaning that it was widely available to everyone and had relatively basic abilities that could be improved by more specialized variants. We have two things in mind as to what benefits it may bring. First, it kind of brings to mind the idea of a defense commander, doesn't it? You know, that person in command of all the troops when a castle is being besieged. If so, Lord of the Castle might be a commander type class that specializes in defending a defined area, meaning they would provide area of effect buffs to any unit within a specific building or structure, including ones as large as a castle. After all, the treasury is guarded by those sentries that resemble the supreme ones, and they were designed to attack any trespasser. So a practical use case would be where Pandora's actor could quickly buff all of these sentries before transforming into one of the supreme ones to engage any intruders. I doubt you had to pick one specific castle too. You could probably change the target area, but it would just take a long time to do so. Furthermore, in exchange for the lack of mobility, the buffs could be much higher than the other similarly powered commander classes. The only problem with this theory is that it sounds more like a specialized commander type class, one of the types that maxes out at level 10, instead of one of the broad generalist level 15 ones. Our second theory is that a lord of a castle could be the most basic form of a type of noble-esque class. These were the administrators and rulers of a region. Nobles are adept at dealing with large sums of money, and they can collect tax from those within their domain, and perhaps even raise conscripts. Maybe a lord of a castle passively generates money over time based on the value of the surrounding terrain or its population. Or maybe they're good at negotiating deals so they get discounts on the money they spend. This would be unlike a general merchant class, who would gain discounts for both buying and selling. Perhaps they also have access to summons or discounts on mercenary vassals. The main reason that I like this theory is that in this context, a lord of a castle seems like it could be the least powerful of the noble type classes, which fits since it caps at level 15. I mean, you're just lord of a single castle, right? You're not exactly a baron with vast swaths of land and multiple lords underneath you, let alone something as powerful as a king. This idea of Pandora's actor as some kind of passive gold generator makes the most sense to me though. Eins had 55 levels to burn, and Pandora's actor was going to spend most of his time mulling around in the treasury, so why not have him passively generate gold or something? Though it's not clear when Pandora's actor was created, Eins did spend a large amount of his time power farming gold to maintain Nazarick once the rest of the guild members had quit. Maybe he thought that Pandora's actor could help lighten the burden and generate some gold on his own. In fact, this might explain where those other 20 levels went to. It's not unreasonable to think that he spent 10 levels each on other lord classes in order to generate more gold. Or in general, there should be classes related to gaining, handling, or saving money. 
And you'd think that as the treasurer, Pandora's actor should have levels in those classes. So in a nutshell, when Pandora's actor isn't transforming into one of the Supreme Ones, he's repairing equipment, spending money at a discount, and maybe even buffing others or producing small quantities of gold out of thin air. In a fight though, he's somewhat weak relative to other high-level combat-oriented NPCs, like Shaltir or Kakitis, even with his ability to imitate lots of the Power Gamer builds of the Supreme Ones. It's that 80% potency that hits him hard. What he offers instead is boundless versatility and a knack for deception. Combine this with his intelligence that's set to rival both Demiurge and Albedo, and you've got yourself an ally that's suited to literally any situation. And that's everything about Pandora's actor. A special three-parter for a special character. For the next character I cover, be sure to vote in the poll under the community section. Right now, Sebas is in the lead, but that could very well change. Now, before I go, here's the second obligatory merch plug. You can get these Succubay shirts from the Teespring link in the description. Anyway, as usual, thank you so much for watching, and if you enjoyed this type of anime content, then you already know what to do. So, until next time, ciao!